Right. Thank you for locking the door. I appreciate it. Right. Appreciate it. The uh, okay. I wanted to uh, explore, uh, you know, the uh, you know a little bit of the nature of uh, Horbena bias. You know, put in it's a type of metaphor that perhaps we could relate to. You know, it's been two thousand years since we've had a base of Mikdash. And uh, Chazal make a uh, you know very very uh, severe uh, statement. Uh, Gemara, it's Yushalmi and Yuma that says Kol Dor Shelo Nivne Beis Hamikdash Biyamav Kilu Nechrava Biyamav. Any generation did not see the rebuilding of the temple in their days. It's as if it was destroyed in their days. That, that's terrible. Like uh, you know, we were born into this problem. You know, and uh, you know. And it's being blamed on us. You know, we, we got born, it happened 2,000 ago, and we were just born into it. And uh, yet, uh, Chazal say that if it's, uh, we have not merited to see its rebuilding, then it's as if it was destroyed. So, uh, <laughs> to give the quick answer, but then we'll go the uh, scenic route to, under, to appreciate it. So, my Rebbe Roshiva of Yaakov Weinberg, Zechron of Racha, said that from this Gemara, this Yerushan just quoted, we learn a, uh, an amazing idea, right? And that is <coughs> that uh, it, is, it is natural to have a base of mikdash on earth. It is natural. And so we know from uh, the laws of nature, the laws of physics, nature in general, things, when they're pushed out of their equilibrium, you know, they push back. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get hurt, the body heals. Right? For every action, there's a reaction that you know, pushes things back to the equilibrium. We see from this Gemara and Yuma that for reasons that we have yet to explain, it is the most natural thing in the world to have a base of Mikdash on earth. Right? And, and, and it should have been at the base of Mikdash, it should have been back by now. Right? Because it was, it's actually an aberration, a deviation that the world is without a base of Mikdash. And if the base of Mikdash hasn't come back yet, it must be that we're still exerting force to prevent it from snapping back. Right? That's clear. Otherwise, uh, how could Chazal say if we didn't see its rebuilding, it's as if we destroyed it? means that it's natural to have a base of Mikdash, and it must be if it hasn't grown back yet, as it were. It's because we must be actively exerting force that's barring it from coming back. An equal force like destroying it. There's a, right? there's a theory here, isn't there? Why? It said that it would be the base of Mish, the third base of Mish will come down Minish Mayim. Right. So is there a theory all of a sudden when the Zaman is? No, I mean, but why does the base of come down already? It should have come down uh, a year or two after Chorben Abayas. When we're entitled to it, right now. We're yeah, but that's the point. Obviously, we are, we are screwing up. Uh, and and the, the amount of negative energy that we're, of, uh, negative energy that we're exerting must undoubtedly be, uh, you know, the same amount of force that it takes to destroy a base of Mikdash. Because it's natural to have a base of Mikdash on Earth, and we would just want to uh, explore that a little bit. But you know, we have to t- you know have in mind you know the gravity of our responsibility, you know of uh, you know <laughs> feeling bad that we haven't brought back the base of Mikdash, and perhaps you know with this we could understand a uh, you know gain a uh, deeper appreciation of Kol Misaba Yushalayim Zochev Roy B'Simchas, someone who truly mourns over Yushalayim will merit to see it in its, in its joy and its uh, in its rebuilt state. Uh, because the person who uh, really mourns over Yushalayim is real with the fact of how bad the world needs it, right? as opposed to the person who just goes through the motions, because, you know, Chazal say, you know, there's all the halachas of the nine days we have to do, but a person who truly is in mourning is real with the fact that the world badly needs the Beis HaMikdosh, and therefore he deserves to see it come back again. <clears throat> so we want to discuss the nature of why it's natural, you know, it, the... It, it was, yeah, it's natural for the world to have a base on Mikdash. And, and, and therefore, we're really living, and we discussed this in our last lecture, we're living in a blemished world. Uh, but the most natural thing in the world is you know, to have a base on Mikdash on earth. <clears throat> so um, we discussed a little bit of these ideas, Hanukkah time, yeah, right? right? Not too long ago, right? right? So, uh, yeah, so it may ring a little bit, might ring a little bit familiar, right? <clears throat> we discussed at the time a, a interesting thing, right? We called Beis Hamikdash, right? The uh, the house of holiness, right? And, you know, the the term bias house is not, not just like oh, we mean to say, you know, uh, like you know, structure where they do the worship, 
And the term bias is essential to the definition of what a base of Mikdash is. Uh, the, the Navi says that in the future, right, the, uh, the Goyim will say, now let El Beis Eloke Yaakov, we are going to ascend to the house of the God of Yaakov, not the God of Abraham and Yitzchak. And so Chazal asks, why is it that Avram and Yitzchak are being cut out of it? It says, you know, lo kavram shekrohar, right, it's not going to be, the third temple is not going to be named after Avram Vinu, who named the Temple Mount, he called it a mountain, by the Akeda. Har Hashem Yehra'eh. So we're taught, you know, by tradition that that was the Temple Mount. He called it a mountain. Evelo ki Yitzchak shekaro sodeh. And not like Yitzchak that called it a field. Shenemar vayetze Yitzchak lasuach basodeh. Right, that's when he established the field of Mincha. So Chazal tells that field was also the Har Moria, the Temple Mount. So he, so Aaron called it a Har, a mountain. Yitzchak called it a sodeh. He called it a field. Ella Yaakov shekaro bias. Shenemar Ainza Kim Baiselo Kim Vizeh Shara Shemaim. Yaakov called the Temple Mount a house. It says when he woke up from his dream, you know, he saw the ladder, you know, with the angels going up and down. Ainza Kim Baisel Kim, this is none other than a house of the Lord. Right? Right? Vizeh Shara Shemaim. But but Chazal say Baisel Kim. And that was brilliant. He was the first one to call the bias. So Yaakov Karol Bias, and that's why the third and permanent temple is going to be named after him, because he's the first one that called it a bias. Now, you also have to get into Yaakov Inu's head over here, right? It was an empty lot, right? There wasn't even two stones on top of each other, because even a few stones were, became one, you know, right? There weren't even, you know, as we say in Ivrit, Loya Evan al Evan, right? You know, not a stone on top of the stone. It's like furthest thing away from a structure, and he still called it a bias. And, and that's called greatness. Greatness on his part. First one. You know, it was an empty lot. <laughs> he was out in the open. And he called it a bias. And that, that's you know, to his credit. And that's why the third temple. You know, I can understand Avram Vinu called it a har. A mountain. Because it is a mountain. And Yitzchak called it a soda because it is a soda. The Ched Sion Soda Techarash says, you says, know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it will be plowed over like a field. Right, God forbid, when it's, uh, in, its, in its state of destruction. Yaakov called it a house, and there wasn't even one whole wall there. It wasn't a roof. <laughs> what is Yaakov you know, thinking? That that's called the greatest understanding of what it's about, and therefore the third and permanent temple will be named after Yaakov and not after Avram and Yitzchak. Maybe he was, maybe it wasn't wrong. He was calling it. I didn't Yaakov. say he was obviously no, no, right. No, 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 no. All of a sudden, all the rock, the three rocks became one. Right. Okay. And the Shemaim became his, uh, his God. I mean, there's, there's a type of that. There's no difficulty. He said, the answer is, you saw the vision. So that was his vision, because he understood it. He has, I think he has his hood, Jacob Abrino. To see the vision, that that's what he has to do. He has his hood, Jacob Abrino. To have Rabbi Hapash to see the vision that that place is going to be the future of the Temple yeah, okay, so, but, he, but, he, but he called it a bayit, right? He first of all called it a bayit, right? He called it a house, and that's called greatness on his part, which means that that which a Beit HaMikdash is called a bias, Beit HaMikdash, but Beit is part of the definition of it. It's not that the house where we happen to, as if its definition is Mikdash. It happens to be the house in which we have the, no, no, no. Bayit, as in Beit HaMikdash, is an essential part of its definition, right? That's what we see from that Chazal. Right? So now, anyone who has learned the Agadites on Chorban Abayis, or matter of fact, any time it's ever mentioned in Shas, almost, right, will find that there's a triple Lushen. Even in the Gemara and Brochus, right, at the beginning of Shas, right, uh, you know, uh, you know Rabbi Yossi Davin's in a Chorva, and he heard a, uh, he heard a Basko, Oili Sheikh Rafti es Beisi, Visarafti et Heichali, and then that, that Lashon is, 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 a, is coined over and over again that there's a, there's a threefold tragedy. Hechrafti at Beisi, Sarafti at Hechali, because of that, you know, the, the house has been destroyed, the chamber has been burnt, and the children have been sent in exile. And it's also in the Agadites and Gittin, which we're going to focus a little bit more on in just a moment. So, on the Tuzano show, it's hard, of course, Hechrivas Beiseinu, Vesarfas Hechaleinu, Viglisino Vena Umos. You always find this triple, you know, this triple description of the tragedy. That, so, you know, that there's 
aside from Shreifat Ha'echol, that the chamber was burned, right? The first thing is, Hechriva es Beisenu, right? Our house was laid desolate. Now, the truth is, you know, uh, the, the term Chorban, right, doesn't necessarily have to mean that something got broken. Now, we, you know, when we, uh, the Gemara we just quoted, right, when the Gemara says uh, that you don't dive in a Chorva, so the Gemara gives three reasons. There's my poet, you know, something may fall on you, right? There's, there's the mazikim, you know, it's the bad stuff, right? <clears throat> and chashad, you know, people might think you're there for promiscuous reasons because, you know, shady things happen, you know, in these. Uh, so the Gemara says that, uh, you know, you need all three reasons because there's something called chorba chadati, right? A brand new chorba. We don't have to worry about my poet. You don't have to worry about any stones falling on you, you know, loose stones. Right? Chorba doesn't mean necessarily that it was destroyed. Right? What's the demolish? It means abandoned. A chorva is an abandoned building, not a, not a destroyed building. Right? Chorev. Like Nahar Yecharav, right? Dry up, right? What? So I say, it, it doesn't have to mean destruction. You know, a house is Chorev from the time that it's been abandoned. Right? When it's the time it's been abandoned. You know, uh, you know that, that's when it's called the Chorva. People don't, you know, don't live there anymore. Right? Right? You know, we find, you know, I'm le Chorava. Chorava, when there's like, uh, there's no more water in the, in the, right? Right? It's dried up. Dried up. Doesn't mean destroyed. It's dried up. It's, it's been abandoned. It's been abandoned. Right? And, and we're going to come back to this point. But we see that, you know, in, in describing the tragedy, it's first, Hechrivas Beisenu, again, bias. Then there's moving forward, you know, I mean, forward, uh, regressing more, I mean to say, Sarfas Hechaleinu, Viglisinu, Vena Umos. But it starts with Hechrivas Beisenu, or Oili Shechrafti as Beisi, Visarafti as Hecholi, whether, of course, we're speaking about himself. What we speak about in terms of ours, it starts with Chorban Abayis, then Shreifad HaHechol, right? As that showing that Chorabite and Shreifad HaHechol, the burning of the house down, are two separate things. <coughs> so, uh, as we uh, mentioned, uh, you know, the, the uh, Agadites, the, the main uh, Agadites on Chorban Abayis are all Meseches Gitten, right? Now, what do you suppose it has to do with the... Uh, with the tractate that talks about the laws of divorce. Right. Well, <coughs> we're actually halfway there to understanding this, right? because what else is called a bias? One of the Tanoim said, Me'olam lo karasi le'ishti ishti v'le shori shori ele le'ishti basi u'le shori sari. One of the Tanoim took credit, he thought it was a greatness on his part. Never called his wife his wife. And he never called his ox his ox. He called his wife his bias, his, his home, right? And he called his ox his field because, you know, it gives him parnasa, right? Right? Beisol zo right? In Hilchos Yom Kippurim, you know, the Kohen Gadol has to be married in order to be kosher to do because the post says, Vechiper ba'ado u ba'ad beso, Right? And that's from there we learn. He has to be married. So much so that Rabbi Yehuda said you have to, he has to have an, ex, an auxiliary wife on hold in case, you know, his wife might die on Yom Kippur. Uh, we don't pass Rabbi Yehuda. We're not Chayshin and Lamisa. Right? But, you know, it's, but it's that important that, you know, Rabbi Yehuda held that you appoint an a auxiliary wife just in case something happens to his wife on Yom Kippur because we need him to complete the avoda and get us kapora. Right? <clears throat> but v'chiper ba'ado u ba'ad beso. Right? You know, beso zu ishto. Right? It's something, uh, you know, something amazing to, uh, to think about because maybe it also sheds light on the, the special relationship that there is, you know, between, you know, man and woman in the context of the Jewish marriage, you know, and of course uh, that it's, we're talking about, you know, male and female and real male and real female from birth. Me'azu uh, mitamid v'lanetzach, right? That's what we're talking about, right? Not so simple in this day and age, right? Hashem <laughs> Yishmerenu. Right? But, but there is a very interesting thing. It's a chazal that everyone knows, but now it's time to, you know, make the connection, you know, connect the dots. It's a, everyone knows the famous chazal. You know, zochu shechina shruya b'nehem. If the couple is virtuous, the shechina dwells between them. Lo zochu eish ochaltam. 
Because right, you know the man has the letter Yud in his, in his you know, Ish, right? And she has the letter He, Isha, right? He and Yud, it's Shem Shamayim, Ka. Right? The name Ka, right? So they have like the divine presence between them. All right, but, uh, you know, and if not, they're consumed by fire. What's that sound like? It sounds like the base of Mikdash. That's where the Shekhinah is, but when we weren't virtuous, it got consumed by fire. Right, there's, a, <coughs> there's definitely a parallel here. Right? <coughs> uh, so the truth is like this. You know, the, um, you know, the, uh, the Torah says something very interesting. Right, that the, uh, you know, after Adam uh, meets Chava for the first time, Lizos Yikare Isha Ki Meish Lekuchazos, we're going to call her Isha, because she was taken from man, and then the Torah goes on to say something, you know, Al Kain Yazov Ish Esav Ve'imo Ve'davak Be'ishto Ve'ayil Basacha, that's why man is going to leave his mother and father, right, click to life, and it'll be one flesh. Right? Something that it doesn't say by all the other creatures that are also created, Zachar and the Keva. All the living creatures that God created were male and female. Right? Uh, but Dafka by man, he will leave his father and mother. V'davak <coughs> b'ishto, v'hayu l'basar echad. The idea is because it, it's going on, you know, the, the, the Sukkim are actually to be read together. Because since she was cut out of man, so they fit together like a jigsaw puzzle, right? And that's why, you know, uh, you know uh, ultimately, a man belongs with his wife. Yazov is avives imo, right? As close as they are to him, as much as he owes them so much. But vidovak biishto, right? That, that's his other half. That's because ki miish lukuchazos, right? Because vahilu basar echad. By the other creatures that were all created, Zohar and the Keva, it never says vahilu basar echad, right? Because the truth is that uh, they, uh, they were, <laughs> it's a simple reason, because the female of all other species wasn't cut out of the male of that species. They emerged from the Adama, you know, Zohar and the Keva. They, uh, they emerged, you know, as separate beings, just a get-together, you know, for the pragmatic reason of uh, procreation and keeping the species going. But the female wasn't carved out <laughs> of the male, Right? And so, and so they don't, therefore, when they get together to keep the species going, it's not called putting the pieces back together, because right? they never were one piece. Right? So that's why a person's ultimate place is, you know, with his wife. Right? So now, what, what is that, you know, the Vedovak Ishto, it doesn't say that by any other creature. Right? So the, the Tomer Dvora, by the great Makubo, Moshe Cordovero, uh, says, you know, uh, regarding the... Uh, the Demida of Malchus, Shechina, Shechina, right, uh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, uh, says, you know, he, that he will dwell amongst us. So he says a very interesting thing that I want to explain. Uh, he says that man's dveikus in his wife is supposed to be our metaphor for our dveikus in the Shechina. Right? And he says that the whole Sefer Tomer Dvar is how a person should conduct his earthly affairs, always trying to parallel the heavenly spheres. And he says a person's relationship to his wife, right? And his dvekas to his wife, that's, that is the, the mushal. You know, that is supposed to be the metaphor that to understand uh, what it means that we should be dovik in our courage borohu. Right? Because why, uh, the neshama is called chelek eloka mimal. Right? In, uh, in this forum. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that God has from him. He didn't cut himself into pieces. God forbid. You know, he's one and indivisible. But it means that God created a type of creature that identifies with God like a part identifies with a whole. Right, so that's the relationship. Even though, of course, the Neshama is a creation. It's not a piece of God. But he created a creation that has this type of perception that it's, you know, it's, you know, it is meant to connect, to totally connect to God. Right? Something that no other creature has. No other creature, every, they, they, get, you know, they get their sustenance from God. Man is the one creature that has the destiny of dveikus, right, to cling. And that's why the neshama that's, you know, created with, with that capacity is called, it is called chelikol kami malim, that's not literal, but it means it clings to God with like a, a type of perception like, like, it feels like it is a part clinging to its whole. That, that's the perception. That's the relationship. Yes. Well, the Balatanis uses the word, the additional word, mavish. 
Okay, well, I'm, I'm going uh, with the more, you know, the literature approach. You know. no, yeah, no, I know. And even over there, the Hasidim have long drushes. Yeah, I know. They have long drushes to explain that it's not literal, literal, but yeah, whatever. You know, they have. No, I, uh, it's complicated because they have long, long drushes. They say mamish, but not mamish, mamish. <laughs> they have long. That means that, you know, the dvekas is real. That's what he means to say. Dvekas is real, even though, of course, you know, uh, you know, God is one and indivisible, but he created cre- a creature like a neshama that clings to him with a, a, a sensation as if it's a part has found its whole. Right? <clears throat> and that's really the, the mushal, you know, between, uh, you know, between uh, that Akash gave us, you know, in our, in our marriage, in the Jewish marriage. Zohu shechina shrei b'neim, Rav Yosef said when he heard his mother approaching, ekum mikame shechinta, I'm going to get up now to honor the shechina that's coming. That the woman... Right, the woman represents the shechina. Right, that uh, and you know, we say the shame yichud kutcher brichu ushchinte. Right, that there are certain divine attributes that are called kutcher brichu, certain called shechina, and the two have to unite. And it's it's like the relationship between zachar and nekeva. Right, the uh, you know the, I mean by the human being, by the human being when it's done bekedusha ubetara. It's a it's a wonderful cosmic union. And and, and it's and uh, when when uh, and it's called right that the that the the universes that God made have come into unison. Right, going go back to again the term Ish and Isha. The Gemara says in Menachos that ki on, on this the name Ka that Ish and Isha form together. Ki beko Hashem sur olamim with the name Ka Hashem fashioned worlds olamim plural. Right, that with the letter Yod, he fashioned the higher realm. And with the letter He, he fashioned the earthly realm. And, you know, and that's why you know, Gemara goes on and on and say, wow, well, this world is like one big He. Easy to fall out, right? Hard to get back in. You could with Shiva, but it's hard. You know, you got to climb and go through the thin, right? You know, the Gemara the Mach goes on and on how the letter He is a very good metaphor for the challenges of earthly life. It's like easy to fall you could get back up again, but it's hard. You know, the, the way to fall out is wide. <laughs> the way to get back in is thin, right? And et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of, you know, in the Gemara over there, right? the, uh, as opposed to the letter Yud, which is one and indivisible, right? Little, it's a point. Letter Yud is a point, right? In Olam Abba, right? It's just, it's an indivisible world. Everyone, Tzadikim, Yoshim, Vatorsem, Baroshem, Venen, and Meziv Ashkina, we're just clinging to the Shechina, and there's no, there's no other place to look, right? And there's nothing, in, and there's nothing barring you, because our Kharjah also says, Machol at Tzadikim, Nagmar says, Machol means everyone sits in a circle. Everyone's equally facing a Kodesh Baruch Hu. There's no interference. Everyone's equally distant, like all the lines on the circumference are equally distant from the center. That's the state of Olamba, like one and indivisible. <coughs> so, ki beko Hashem sur olamim. Right, HaKadosh Baruch Hu fashioned worlds, and He wants those worlds together. You know, he wants the heavenly and the earthly, there should be an open portal between the two, an open flow, that, you know, the Kedusha should course freely from the heavenly to the earthly, and that's when we have a state of bracha and Kedusha in this world. We have, we spoke about this uh, the last time we met, that Shabbos is in time, what a Beis HaMikdash is on earth, and that's why the Torah always puts the two parshas together, and from the Hekesh of Mishkan, Melechus HaMishkan, to Shabbos, we learned that it's also to do on Shabbos, whoever went into Melechus HaMishkan, and Shabbos Hilsai Tishma Mikdashi Tiro, Ani Hashem, right, it's all over the Chumash, right? So on Shabbos, you know, what's one of the leading Zmiris? Koribon. Koribon Olam the Olmaya. Right? You're a Ribon of Olam, that's the higher world. The Olmaya, right? And the world below. The hidden world, Olam, also means Ne'olam. The hidden world, the realm above, the Olmaya. Unto Malka Malch Malchai. And we talk about in this whole Piyut, right? All about how God reigns over everything, the higher and the lower, and with the name Ka, which, you know, which represents that with this name you fashion two worlds, and we want the worlds get, get together. Now the universes in time get together on Shabbos. And that's why, you know, everything becomes one cloud, 
And then it becomes You have Bracha and Kedusha. Well, Kedusha clearly comes from the beyond. But Bracha, right? Follow me on this. Bracha also comes from the beyond. Bracha means more. Hey, there is as much as there is. Matter could be neither created nor destroyed. There is as much as there is. What do you mean Bracha? Where does the more come from? It's got to come from somewhere else. So Shabbos Mekor HaBracha because, you know, bracha has to be imported from somewhere else. Because here, there is what there is. Right? There is as much as there is. Right? So Shabbos is where the universes meet. You know, in time, in space, that's the base of Mikdash. That's where the portals are open. That's where the Shechina, you know, God from on high, comes down and dwells amongst us. Right? You know, so speaking about the, uh, you, know, you know, you know what it's like, body and soul. Right? Man who has this great destiny to be Dovik and Akkadish Baruch It's man who has to keep Shabbos. It's man who has to do the Avod and the Beis HaMikdash. It's man who has this wonderful relationship with his wife that Zohar Shechina Shruya Bineam. Look at man himself. He's made out of two opposites. A body from earth and a neshama from heaven. Right? Man himself is a walking composite of what you know, uh, a Beis HaMikdash is all about. Right? And that's why also something very interesting, uh, it's, it's, in, it's in Chazal, it's in the Zohar, it's in the Kuzri, it's in a letter that the Rambam wrote to his son, that uh, another way to look at the Beis HaMikdash is to view it as like a human form. Right? You know, the, uh, the Oron with the Luchos is the heart, the Kruvim on top of the Oron are like the lungs, and the Mizbech is like the stomach, this is, you know, and the, and the, the Malbim brings all this also, right? You know, that the, uh, that the uh, you know, the Shechina dwelling in the Beis HaMikdash is like a Neshama dwelling in a body, right? So now every individual has his own soul and his own body. But in the, but, you know, you know, the Tsar says about Nadav and Avihu, who weren't married, and that was one of the things that was wrong with them, that they were plag gufa, half a body. Their body was incomplete. Because we know from halacha, ishto kegufo. Ishto kegufo. We find this all over halacha. Ishto kegufo, as far as many, many halachas. Right? So there, you know, a man without a woman is plug gufa. No, so he has his own body, but it's not. Because, it's, because he's not full. He's not full because the integrated unit of basar echad is man and woman together. Ishto kegufo. And that's why beso zu ishto. The body is the house of the neshama. The neshama resides in the body. That's its, that's its home. Right? The bias is, you know, the, the guf is the bias of the neshama. Beso zu ishto, and she fulfills, and she, uh, you know, she builds up, you know, man without wife is plag gufa, which means that she is like his body, and he is like her neshama. And this desire says in Parshas Chaye Sarah, right, discussing Maras HaMachpela, right, where, which was the first burial, honorable burial in history. Never, ne, first time in history that there was a Leviah and a Kvura. You know, it, it, that doesn't get mentioned. Oh, a Kvura did get mentioned once. You know, Cain, he hid Hevel, you know, underground. But that wasn't very honorable. And that was without a Hespit. And, you know, the final respects for a body, the first time we find it, is Avram doing it for Sarah in Parshish Chai Sarah. The idea of, you know, final respects and an honorable burial and a very interesting thing, he buys Mara Samachpela. He's got his eye on that piece of real estate, where it's called Mara Samachpela for two main reasons. There are more reasons, but two main reasons. First of all, double, only couples are buried there. Adam and Chava, Avram and Sarah, Yitzhak and Rivka, Yaakov and Leah. Right, couples. Maybe, I'm just wondering, it just hit me now. Well, I'm wondering if couple is kaful, right? It's the same word. I, it just occurred to me now. Just wondering. Couple. Kaful. Kefal. Kefal. It just hit me now. <laughs> I said this year for years. And I said, I wonder. Yesh lion. Right? <laughs> yeah, anyway. But then there's... No way. That's what I'm saying. This was the first real one. That was just a cover-up, you know. You know, he was trying to cover up, you know. He uh, was hiding there. Yeah, yeah, they, I, I was saying, I, I was saying, I was, I was being sarcastic when I said, yeah, it was kind and evil, that wasn't uh, real. So, right? 
Right? So it's couples, right? And then there's also, it was a bias va'aliyah. It was two stories, right? It was a bias va'aliyah al-gabeha, right? An amazing thing, right? That Avram and Sarah revealed the special relationship that there is in Jewish marriage, that and it's all in the Zohar right there, in the Medrash Hanelam and Parshas Chayesar, you could take a look there, it's all black and white, what I'm saying, right? that, uh, that they revealed the Kedusha that there is in marriage, which is the Kedusha that there is in the body, that the body has a real relationship with the soul. And even in death, they do not part. And, there's, uh, you know, and, and by a Leviah, the soul comes and says a Hesped on the body. And the righteous body, says the Zohar, Kedain Sara Ikri. The righteous goof is called Sara. And, and that's all. And, you know, just like Avram Avinu came to say a hespit on Sara, at, at a Levi of a righteous man, his neshama comes to say a hespit on the body that it misses so much was like his wife. Right? And, and the idea of being buried, you know, together is that, you know, death is only going to be temporary because the body is not going to lose its kesher to the neshama. Even in death, they do not part. And that's what it means, habayis va'aliyah, right, the house, and then the attic. That's the relationship of body and soul, right? The, the, the body is the bias, the neshama is the aliyah, the second story. But you, you need, you know, the aliyah needs the bias. It can't stand alone in this world. Right? And that, that's everything that's represented over there. So now, the, uh, you know, so to break it down a little bit further, in the individual, in the individual, right, everyone knows that the soul has many names, and it's not for uh, no reason. You know, it's called nefesh. We find it's called ruach, and we find it's called neshama. Right? We find these three terms. So the nefeshachayim explains in Shar Aleph, you know, based on the Zohar and the Mekubalim, uh, that uh, you know, uh, from nefesh we get our capacity of action, from ruach we get our capa- the, the spiritual dimension of our capacity of action. From ruach we get the spiritual dimension of our power of speech, and neshama is the power that gives us to understand the Torah, and it says, and therefore the nefesh is mamish in the body, right? The ruach is part in, part out. The neshama is not even inside the body. You know, it's, it's, by, it's still by God. It's called God's breath, neshama. Nishmas pivis barach. It's as it were, that's the part that's still by God, clinging to him. That man has a dveikus with God, even in this world. You know, just it's pretty far removed from where his body is. That's why we don't feel it. You, know, you could try to feel it. Right? If you strengthen the connection of all the rings, you know, all the rungs, you know, all the links in the chain. Right, but the part that's in the body, mamish, is called nefesh. So now we find that, God forbid, by penalty, by the, uh, the terrible, uh, the, the big, big sins, you know, there's a chi of kares, right? Cut off. Now you'll always find, without fail, it, it works out always, that you'll find the term kares with nefesh. Like clockwork. Kares goes with nefesh. You'll never find kores by ruach. You're never going to find kores by neshama. Right? And, and that's good. That means that the, as my, the terrible damage that we could do to ourselves is, God forbid, you could cut off the nefesh from the chain. And that, that's called that the file, your file's been deleted because the aspect of the neshama that inhabits the body and therefore is, infuses all your actions with a spiritual dimension, that part has been cut off from the rest of the chain. And that's why I called that your file is deleted. Because right, you as an individual, you're not your body, you're not your soul, you're the composite of both. Right? That's, that's who you are, and that's how you're judged. Like uh, you know, Rebbe explained to Antinus, God judges the body and soul together, so no one, they, they can't frame each other and say, you did it. No, you did it. God judges them as an integrated unit. Right? So a person, but Chorus is in the nefesh. Right, and that's you know, and that's the big tragedy of that a person's files deleted. Of course, with shuva, anything could be done, and everything could be rebuilt. Right, but but that's where, but being cut off is cutting off the nefesh, which is the part that inhabits the body, from the other parts of soul that are beyond body, partially and wholly. So now, divorce. Biblical term for divorce is nos kosovla sefer krisus. Sefer Krisis, the get is called Sefer Krisis, a book of severance. A book of severance. So my Roshiva Zechron Livracha, who we quoted from at the beginning of the session, used to always say, you know, since Vahayu Lebasar Echad, you know, divorce is not, it's not undoing a agreement. It's amputation. It's, you know, because Vahayu Lebasar Echad. So, so, you know, the, and now we explain, Ishto Kegufo. 
Right, so she is like she's she's the and there's this. So when a man undergoes the the tragedy of divorce, that's called chorus. No, the chorus to the integrate unit, because he's like the soul. He's has the yud from the heavenly realm. She has the hay from the earthly realm. So it's cutting off the nefesh from the ruach and the neshama. That's the terrible tragedy of divorce, right? And and that is korban. Habayis. So first we understand the famous Gemara again, that a person that divorces Ishtar Shon of Mizbeach Moyel of the most, the Mizbeach cries for a person who divorces his, uh, his uh, soulmate. Right? That's, uh, the Mizbeach cries for him. Right? But, the, <coughs> but if Beso Zu Ishtar, right? so, you know, Churban Habayis is called, you know, Kores. And uh, that the Nefshachayim says in Shara Beis, at the end of Shara, excuse me, Right, that <coughs> that Chorben you know, the Shechina, which inhabits this world, is cut off, right, from the other uh, levels of divine energy, and it's called Shechinta Begalusa. Now, the Shechina goes into exile because it's cut off from the levels called Kuchabricho and Eimabarim, all different levels of divine revelation that all parallel, those different levels parallel, Nefesh, Ruach, and Neshama in the individual. There's the cosmic, the Shechina, cosmic Nefesh. Kuchabrichu, cosmic ruach, Ema Bodim, cosmic neshama, and the shechina has been cut off. Right? Eicha, the Medrash Eicha says, Eicha is Gematria 36. There are 36 krisus in the Torah, 36 averse, there are chayev kores, and they read that, Lo hoglu so acha avru al lamid vav krisus. Right? Because golus is national kores, and that's like divorce. Right? So now going back to the kori bone. The very final stanza. Le Mikdashek Tuv. Ula come back to your base word. Ula Kars Kuchin. Asar di Beyechdon Ruchin Venafshin. Where the Ruach and the Nefesh are reunited. Right? But the Nefesh gets cut off, right? So they're saying that that Khorban Abayas was national divorce, which is what it, you know, what divorce is to the integrated unit of man and woman is is what Kharis is to the individual. Right? And that's what Chorbet Abayas is, that the relationship was severed. Right? The relationship that, you know, that Akash was always intended to roll out because he wanted a unified universe. Right? He wanted the higher realms and the lower realms to be together and there should be a constant flow of Kedusha and Bracha fl- flowing through the world like the world, like Utopia will be, Bimhera Biamenu, a world full of Kedusha and Bracha. Right, where the, uh, the higher realm is mashpia to the lower realm, and that state is called marriage. And, and, that, and that's the human mission. That's the whole point of man, that he has a neshama from heaven and a body from earth, that man is supposed to be the creature that makes this union. Right? And that's why the Asui Mikdash, the Shachanti Besocham, Besocho Lo Neemaro, Besocham, the Ikr Shechida is in Am Yisrael. Right, because it's, it's man that makes, this, uh, that, that makes the Beis HaMikdash work. It's built on the humanity principle. Right, the humanity principle that's, you know, is the composite, you know, the one who brings the universes together. The Neshama from heaven with the Guf from earth. And in the integrate unit, the, the Zohar and the Nekeva. Right? And that's what the Beis HaMikdash is supposed to be. Right? <clears throat> and that's what Yaakov Avinu, that's what Yaakov Avinu figured out. Right? To Avram Avinu, you know, you know, to approach divinity was a har. It's a mountain to climb. And it's true. It's, you know, it's, it's a lot of madregas. But he saw, he saw it as the challenge. Right? And Yitzhak Avinu saw it as work. He called it a soda. What are you doing? You know, yeah, it's work. It's avoida. Right? 100% true. Yaakov Karo bias. You know, we're, it's not, it's not, you know, of course, it, it is a mountain to climb, and there is work to do, but that's not where it ends, right? That's just the beginning. The point is, it's a relationship. It's a marriage. It, it's, it's unity. It's unity. It's, you know, to be family, like, and that's called that the world is in its utopic state. When the flow of energy goes freely, there's Kedusha and Bracha that comes from beyond flowing freely in Olam Hazeh. And the world is so blemished, you know, the way the world is right now, that heaven and earth have nothing to do with each other. Right? Uh, you know, maybe if they would have kept it, you know, in bounds, they would have kept it in bounds, you know, the idea of separation of church and state wouldn't have been such a bad idea, but it's, that's not where they're taking it now. Right, you cannot, you know, put the Ten Commandments on public display, 
right? They are coming to, right, totally break the connection, right? You know, uh, <clears throat> and you know, this is you know the the uh, the lack of kedusha in the world is like is the is at its most severest point. Uh, we know that Kodesh Baruch Hu is so nezima; he hates promiscuity. You know, and you know, Hashem should help us. You know, so we can understand now the uh, that the uh, the uh, the, the idea of a base of Mikdash and bias, dafka, bias, right? And, and that's what it means. A bias is nechrav, the minute that the, the home is broken when man and woman, you know, they're not, when they're not together, that's when it's called a broken home. You know, we say a kid is nebuch from a broken home. It doesn't mean that the house burnt down. Broken home means, you know, there's no shalom bias. No shalom bias, right? And that's hechrivas beisenu. There's no shalom bias between us and our Kaddish Baruch Hu. So then it, just, then it just goes like dominoes. An interesting thing, Chazal note the phenomenon. When a, a building is abandoned, people don't live there anymore. It starts falling apart. It's just a, So Chazal you know, attribute that, that the shade didn't move in. Shia Yukat Shar, there's a shade called Shia that moves in. And that's why people, Gemara says, a person would rather you know, rent out his house or even have someone house sit for free because... Place abandoned properties begin to fall apart because whereas a vacuum of kedusha, a vacuum of shalom bais, you know, in that vacuum the sitra achra moves in, and that's why it moves from hechrivas beisenu just means there's no more shalom bias between us and our kaddish baruch Hu, right? The cosmic unity has been disrupted. But now where, the, where there's a gap and a rift in cosmic unity is where the sitra achra moves in, and therefore it goes and things begin to fall apart. Of sarfas hecholenu. And Viglisinu Bena Umas, things you know, start burning down and get scattered, but it starts with Hechrivas Beisenu. Right? It starts from Lo Zachu Eish Ochaltam, but step one is Lo Zachu, that the Shechin is no longer Shruya Beneim. Then Eish Ochaltam, then things begin to fall apart, because where there is a lack and there is a, uh, a vacuum of Kedusha, the Sitra Achra moves in. But it starts with not having a connection and shalom bias with our Baruch Hu, shalom bias with the Shechina, right? And uh, and 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 that is as natural as Bria Sa'olam. When God created the different realms, He wanted all the realms are part of one universe. Cosmic unity is as basic as creation itself. That's why it's so natural to have a base on Mikdash on Earth. And that's what Chazal say, Nisava Kodesh Baruch Hu Shielo Dira Batachtorim, a Kodesh who wanted to have a dwelling place here on the earthly realm. Right? That's, uh, it's cosmic unity. If he created a world, he created all so many cosmic forces and so many different dimensions, he wanted them all to get along. They're all part of his world, his one united kingdom. And that's why Beis Midrash is so natural. And it must be that we, you know, are Nebuch exerting some type of force because it is, cosmic unity is as natural as creation itself. So we must be exerting a force that's barring the natural unity, you know, to reinstate itself. The Beis Midrash should have grown back. It's as natural as what God wants. <clears throat> we'll just end off with a Chazal. Uh, and it's so... Uh, it's so applicable to this day and age. At least we could take uh, solace to the fact that we're at the end of the story finally. Chazal say that, uh, you know, Cain killed Hevel. Right? Uh, and he thought that uh, he, he didn't hurt the whole world. Right? Esau says, Shota ya Cain. Cain was an idiot. Because he killed Hevel. But then Adam and Chava got back there. They had chase. You know, so he thought with killing Hevel it would get the whole world. Yeah. Nothing doing. I'm not going to make that mistake. Yikramu Yimei Evel Avi Vargas Yaakov Achi, that he was planning to kill Yitzchak. Because I mean, just kill Yaakov Avi, man, Yitzchak might have another kid, you never know. So Yikramu Yimei Evel Avi, why Yikramu Yimei Evel Avi? Because he himself was going to kill Yitzchak, and then I'm going to kill Yaakov. Right? Then Paro says, right, Shoytahaya, Shoytahaya Esav. Paro says, Esav was an idiot. Right? Because while he was planning for the opportune time to kill Yitzchak, Yaakov went over to Beis Lava and had the 12 tribes. No, no, no. I'm not going to make that mistake. I'm going to kill out all the male folk. Right? Comes Haman and says, right? Right? Because you know, that while you know, he's throwing all the boys and that, but the women are making sure to keep the Jewish nation going because the Allah is Eved Va'akma Ba Basisra Vlad Kosher. Right? The kid is Jewish, even though, especially since Kalvachomer, that they made sure to only have relations with Jewish men. But even if not, still, 
The halacha, Ami sort of continued. That's not a way to do it, says Haman. You know, so he says, you know, so Ami, we have to do, you know, you know, tough the nashim. You have to kill out everybody. That's the only way to do it, right? And and then everyone's been in Haman mode ever since, up till you know the Tzorer Yemachshimo seventy years ago, Hashem Yirachem, right? You know, there it is. But you know, but then it says the Medrash, and we're there now. We at least that's our our nechamas that we're there already, right? Gog is going to come and say Shoita Yehaman, Yeshlem Patron Gadol Bashamayim. He was, uh, yeah, he has Gog. Any way you can explain to us what's going on? I, I, you know, I, I, I can't tell you. It's probably an ideology. You know, it's not because we don't divide up the map anymore the way they did in the days of the Bible. So I guess you would identify it by ideology. Right? <clears throat> I give you a whole long list of suggestions. Uh, but Gog says, Homer was an idiot. He didn't realize they have a patron God, they have a great patron in heaven. You've got to take down God first. Oh. Right? And then you could take them. And that's what the Pasuk says to them. Nos do al Hashem va'al Meshicho. Right? Gog is there, does that first to take on God. And then, then you could take on his anointed. But you have to take down God it first. Sounded like Amalek. It sounded like Amalek. How you have described Gog. It looked like Amalek to me. Because Amalek no, no, man, no, no, no. The, the liberals have outdone Amalek. No? Right? The liberals have outdone him. Right? So now the Shlach, Kaddish already asks, with what weapon do you take out God? How do you do it? How do you take him down? So it says the Shlachar said it prophetically 400 years ago, right? Apikorsus, right? Make God irrelevant. That's how you kill God. You kill God by making him irrelevant, right? You break his connection. You break the connection that there is between him and mankind. Spreading apikorsus, spreading apikorsus, right? Spreading apikorsus. That's how you take down God. Because you don't have to mamish, kill him. So you just have to make him irrelevant. He's, he's as good as dead. Like Nietzsche, God is dead, right? Nice. To make whatever it's uh, you know, yeah, you know, public display of religion is a microaggression. What do I say, you know, everything just to drive our courage Baruch Hu out, and that's where we're holding, right? Which is the you reach the op- total antithesis of what a base of mitzvahs is all about at the end of time. You reach the total antithesis, and when we defeat that, that's when the base of mitzvahs has to come back. Right? But we have to make sure that we're fighting and we're not contributing. The rebuttal should help. You know, uh, I just asked the, yeah. um, to keep you in the audience. I actually was, uh, I asked the same question on Sunday, so whatever. But, uh, you know, talking about based on Middash and talking about the headlines and making it very relevant with the right. headlines, it seems like the political developments in Eretz Yisrael now that Absolutely. the Mavak over the Harab bias is starting. Meaning in 67, God thrust Yushalayim and the Harabais into our hands. Right. Dayan ran and gave it back. He didn't want that hot potato. He gave it back. He didn't want religion. He didn't want the third base. I mean, that's what he writes in his autobiography, by the way. Yeah. He's afraid that if it would be within his Jewish control, there'd be a push to build a third temple, and he did not want that. He didn't want to live in a religious state, etc. But but now, so we've tried to accede, give that hot potato away as much as possible, but now it's being thrust back in other words, in terms of are we declaring sovereignty over it or not, are we, do we want it, do we not want it, that seems to be where we're up to in terms of the, this whole State of Israel Zionist project. Right. How do you view, what, what are your thoughts on that current struggle, how to approach it, and how it fits into the well, broader I mean, uh, scheme of Gula? I mean, uh, I, I know it's a hypothetical. And it's very hypothetical, and, and that, lot, they, they don't ask do me. Do you have any thoughts on that? that no, no I, I think you described it very well. We basically gave it back again. Netanyahu folded, right? They yeah, took but, out. But the Arabs are not letting, that's the thing. In other words, they, I don't know if you know the latest. Words, I don't know the latest. With the, with, with the metal detectors, but, so they're going to they're gonna put less intrusive smart cameras instead. In a few the months' Arabs time. Said, no, we're not going to any change whatsoever, any kind of technology, anything. We're not going back up there. We're still protesting. You have to return it to the way it was before the murder of those people. So in other words, the Arabs are not letting us. Right. So that's the way God's engineering it. But how do you how do you mesh? Obviously, on the one hand, we have to be spiritually worthy in terms of our up, right. up, up Torah mitzvah observance. Right. Yet on the other hand, there seems to be a concurrent political struggle in terms of exerting Jewish sovereignty. Uh, uh, we're getting. How, how do, how, how we're having mesh? a mirror held up to us. Dashgacha is holding up a mirror to us. This is what you look like. Right. Mean, meaning what? This is what you like. You have no connection to Harabais. Right. That these goyim are, you know, unfortunately, in a perverted way, God is on their lips more often. You know, 
Allah, Alu Akbar, God is on their lips more often than by the average Israeli. And they are assertive of their rights. Yeah, so, their, I, their, so their, I say, uh, religious yeah. rights, very often the Hashgachah just holds up a mirror to you. This is what you look like. That's right. We should take it to heart and make amends. And uh, this time next year, we'll be in the basement. Shlishi, b'mehar b'amenu. Amen. 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 Amen.